Jeffrey subject tonight is psychology study number 27, Revelation chapter 4. I bring you up to speed to where we are tonight in tonight's study with chapter 4. We are now moving from the present to the future. That's what the book of Revelation is about. He was commanded to write of things past, present, and future. And, of course, now we know by studying that chapter 1, we find things that has happened in the past. One references to the shed blood of Jesus Christ, a past event. So we know that chapter 1, he is writing at least in part of the things past. Chapters 2 and 3 is the present, and that is the seven letters that was written to the seven churches of Asia that we finished up in our last Bible study. That is where we are now in this book of Revelation, the church. That is where we are located. Uh, I've had people ask me and, and people ask the question from time to time, where are we in the book of Revelation? And we are coming to the conclusion of chapter 3, which is where the church resides now. Uh, because, as I've, you've heard me say so many times, I'm still delivering a message to the church, to this particular part of the church. So we are still in the present. But now, going into chapter 4, then it is all about to change. We go from the present to what will begin the future and future events that John sees that he was commanded to write to warn the church and the world of the imminent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the destruction of this planet as we know it today. It will be completely destroyed, not by water as we have studied and has happened in time past, but by fire. And it is a fact that it will be destroyed by fire. And this time we read in Revelation 21 and 22, Behold a new heaven and a new earth. And that's what we as Christians look forward to. But getting on into the chapter, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, he writes, After this I look, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. And again, it is clear by that last word that he's speaking of future events. Now, in studying Bible prophecy, I teach fervently that verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4 is signifying the actual event of the rapture. Many do not believe that, especially those that hold to the mid-trib doctrine and the post-trib doctrine certainly do not believe that at all. But the facts of the matter is, this is exactly where the rapture takes place in the book of Revelation in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. And when we examine these two verses, it's going to be, to me, quite easily understood. I even know some folks that teach a pre-trib rapture that don't believe that even this is the rapture. And I've often wondered what those people are really confused because if this is not where the rapture takes place, then where? And I've asked them and, and not even get an answer from it. But notice there's three things that we must notice about verse 1. And the first thing that we notice is the phrase, after this, which is significant to understanding what is meant by these two verses and the event that takes place here by this very phrase, after this. John is making reference. Now, he had just completed the last letter to the church at Laodicea. That was the seventh and final letter that was to be written. 
so he is alluding to something happens after this. After what? Seems a fair question to ask. After the last message given to the church, something happened. It's undeniable that something dramatic on a global scale happened at this precise point in the book of Revelation. So, the second thing to notice is what happened, and the second phrase to notice is, he said, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, up until this point, John is on earth. He is on the Isle of Patmos. No one can deny that. He's been spoken to by an angel, many believe to be Gabriel, who is signifying to John these things that is to come, to be hereafter, and he is writing them down in a book. He writes these seven letters. After this, he looks into heaven and he sees something happening. Behold, he said, a door was opened in heaven. Now, what is a door? A door is an entrance, an entrance way or a passageway from one place to another. To get into this church, you had to come through the door. To get out of this church, you got to go through the door. It's not that hard to understand. So we know by his phraseology used here that he looks into heaven and he sees an entrance way. Why is that? Because that's where he's going to enter into heaven, through the door. Now, we look at that in a natural sense, in a spiritual sense. In the spiritual sense, that is why that Jesus says, I am the door to the sheepfold, meaning that Jesus is an allegory to a door, meaning that he is the entrance way to heaven, meaning that we must do exactly what he says to do to be saved. That's how he could claim the title, I am the door. St. John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by me. Why? Because he's the door. Here, the door is that entrance way between heaven and earth. I was watching a program the other night, The Son of the Universe, and, and uh, Einstein's theories of relativity and all of that, and he believed in space and time and matter, that he somewhat believed in space travel, in time travel, in which a person could travel if they could, if it was possible. He never proved it, but it was hypothetical. That if a person could travel through space time, that they would not age. Faster than the speed of light. So he surmised that in different areas of space, there were what he labeled as wormholes, which would take one from one dimension to another. If a person could find that wormhole, which is a tube-like or tunnel or entrance, or as John refers to, a door, and he could pass through that. Now, those that believe in UFOs, I watch a lot of those programs uh, about aliens and things, and those that believe in such things as that, that they believe, rather than a creative God, that they there were um, intelligent life that come to earth that created and instilled in man intelligence and brought him to where he is today. And they traveled from out of space to earth through these wormholes. And that's how they got here. And then they surmised that there's different places on earth, even under the sea, that these wormholes exist and passageways. And if we could find them, then we could 
travel through time. That was just all a hypothetical theory of Einstein's. It never was proven. But the fact of the matter is, there is a door between heaven and earth. That is a biblical fact. And one of these days, the church will travel through that door into heaven from this dimension into another dimension. That is a biblical fact, not relying on Einstein or Newton or anyone else. Laws of physics, we have the Word of God that proves that. So now John sees this door, and a UFO theorist believes it's a wormhole, and the door is open. Okay? So that is significant. That tells us, and we'll soon see, that he's getting ready to leave earth and be transported translated, or raptured. UFO theorists like to use the word transported, which means the same as translated or raptured. We use the word rapture. He's getting ready to be transported. That is true. And it's through this door, why else would it be open? I want to say it's closed now. But it would be open. A door was open. So that tells us that it's closed or it is closed now, right? Agree? Well, sure, but that's the way it reads. A door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. Now we know about First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16, and behold the Lord uh, descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The trump of God is not a horn, but it is the words spoken by God. So up until this point, after the message or the last letter he wrote, a door is open, and then there's a third thing we must understand about this verse, the phrase, Come up hither. It means what it says. If I looked at any one of you and said, Come up hither, you would understand that I would want you to leave where you are and come up hither. We don't much use the word hither. I say, Come here. Come here. Hillbilly language. Hither. Or come up here, I guess would be the proper phrase. But you would get my meaning, right? Come up here. You know that I want you to get come up here. Well, I hope for saying that I mean for you to come up here. I mean for you to come right now. <laughs> right? But same thing. He used this phrase, come up hither. I believe these will be the exact words that he uses to initiate the rapture of the church. Come up hither. And I will show these things which must be hereafter. Now, he's being signified to him by the angel what to write to the seven churches. Now, I'm going to transport you or translate you or rapture you from earth into, and you're going to come in to heaven through this door. And then I'm going to show you what must be hereafter. If that's not a rapture, there won't be one. I'm telling you, this is absolutely it. It absolutely is. I will show these things which must be hereafter. We read of this phrase again in Revelation chapter 11, verse 11 and 12. Now, building up to this, we didn't want to read it all. In the midst of great tribulation, there's going to be two prophets show up whom I believe to be Moses and Elijah. They will be on earth and they will prophesy in Jerusalem. They will be killed. Their dead bodies will lay in the streets, I believe, for three and a half days. After the three and a half days, this is what happens to these two prophets in the time of great tribulation. 
And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entereth into them, meaning they're resurrected, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them, meaning all the world, by television. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. Now to prove my point in verse 1 of chapter 4, which is identical to this, meaning the same, and they ascended, which means to go up, and they, who are these two prophets, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So we know by verse 1 that this is absolutely the rapture of the church, and it is a biblical proof that it happened pre-tribulation. I'm astounded that these prophecy teachers cannot understand that, as simple as it is. Now, verse 2. John was alive on Patmos when he was caught up into heaven. That was his problem. No one can go to heaven in these natural bodies. Jesus made it plain. He said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Can't do it. Can't do it. These corruptible bodies cannot. There must be a change. That's why Job said that he waited for his change to come. This is why what is spoken in verse 2. And immediately, now this is before he went through the door into heaven. And immediately I was in the Spirit. The significance of that is, that's what rapture is. That's what being translated is. Or transformed. Being transported is, there must be a physical metamorphosis to this human body. There must be a change from this mortal to immortality, from this corruptible to incorruptible, which goes along hand in hand with exactly what Paul said in 1 Corinthians to the church, chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning everybody won't be dead after rapture. There'll be some live people like John is here. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, meaning we will be in the Spirit. How fast will it happen? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, there's that trump, of 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16, in a moment and twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, come up hither, that's the trumpet, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. John, before he could be caught up into heaven, had to be changed from that mortal to immortality. That's why we have to be changed. That's one of the many reasons why you have to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's going to be the Holy Ghost that changes these bodies. The Bible says that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. You've got to have the Holy Ghost to change your body to that incorruptible body. You've got to have it. So when John sees the door open, immediately... He is in the Spirit for change in order to enter into heaven. The second thing we notice about verse 2, And behold, a throne was set in heaven, singular. Now, there's more than one throne in heaven. But the, this specific throne, there's only one of them. And that's where God sits. Now, there's 12 thrones, and uh, I believe he told the 12 apostles, you shall sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? 
And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And we went through the Godhead, and we have proved emphatically, despite the Trinitarian doctrine or the doctrine of dualism, that there is only one God. We have proven already, without going into it tonight, that Jesus Christ is the manifestation of that one God in flesh. Mark 12 and 29. Jesus said, listen, And Jesus answered him the first of all commandments. This is above everything. If you don't believe this, I don't care how many commandments he teaches, you can't be saved. You can't do it. And, you know, they can talk about us if they want to for standing for this doctrine or standing for this monotheistic way for this belief in one God. But Jesus said, the first of all, the time that he placed emphasis upon this commandment using first. If you don't keep this in second, third, fourth, fifth, and right on through, it won't matter. The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And until you get that, you can forget the rest because none of the rest matter. How you live don't matter. If you're baptized or not, don't matter. Nothing matters. Jesus said, I said therefore unto thee, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Let me repeat himself. Except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You must have a revelation of who Jesus is. It is abundantly clear in studying this book of Revelation that this one throne is inhabited by the one true God, Jesus Christ. Now, we will study some things in chapter 5 of Revelation that if you wanted to, you can take out of context. And if you don't understand... um, symbolism, the symbolism of the book of Revelation, you can try to conclude or come to the conclusion that there's possibly two because we'll read of how the Lamb comes and takes the book out of the right hand of him that sits upon the throne. And I'll explain that when we get there. Trinitarians see that as the Father is sitting on the throne Jesus, who we clearly teach is the Lamb, walks over to him and gets a book out of the right hand of him that sits on the throne. That's the way that it reads. But that is not what it means. There are things that is to be taken literally, and then there are things that is to be taken symbolically. And we must be able, that's why Paul said rightly dividing the word of truth, we must have the ability to understand when to take things symbolically and when to take things literally. To take something literally is to take it, it says what it means, and it means what it says, as it is written. But to take something symbolically means that it is written one way and it means something else. It is an allegory, um, symbolic of something else. That's what it means. And a lot of people can't understand this Bible because they don't understand allegories. They don't understand symbolism. But it is clear as to the Godhead, there is but one throne. And there's only one that sits upon the throne. If there had been three, there would have been three thrones. One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. We read none of that. Why is it? Why is it? You would think those Trinitarian people would, would, would wonder if there are three, three distinct persons, why are there not three thrones? I mean, it's only logical to believe that or to, to wonder why that's not the case. Especially when you proclaim that all three are co-equal, co-existent. 
that they would all three have a throne. But it's not the case. There's not three thrones because there's not three persons. There's only one. God, the Bible says, to wit, W-I-T, which means witness, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. When you see Jesus, that's why Jesus said in St. John 14 and 9, he that has seen me has seen the Father. That's why he said in St. John 10 and 30, I and my Father are one. It is just that simple. Verse 3. Now, John is changed. He's in heaven right now. Where this throne is. Now, he's going to give us an eyewitness description. He's going to give us something, in fact, that Paul didn't give us. When Paul was caught up into paradise and heard words not lost would be uttered, when he came back, he couldn't even tell about it. John is going to give us light that Paul couldn't give. He's going to give us a bird's eye view of the throne room of heaven. And he says in verse 3, And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper. Now, there's somebody on the throne, right? And he's a he. reading what the Bible says. Do you know there's some people out there trying to make God non-gender now? They are. And they are silly people out there that want to take the he out of the Bible and just refer to God as God and not refer to him as he. There's a reason that God took on the male gender. It's because of authority. Or one of the reasons. You may not want to be referred to as a woman either. Just stop you. I don't want nobody calling me a sissy. You, you. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, he is referred to in the masculine. Right? He is. If you disagree with that, you have to take that up to him on judgment day. If you're mad about that, you're most likely going to get into heaven anyway. Now, Ain't going to really matter a whole lot. Because these dummies out there that believe that, they just don't believe he's male or female. Well, I'm just reading how he's referred to. And he that sat, I mean, after all, Jesus could have come as a baby girl. Couldn't he? If he wanted to. And his name could be Jessica. Right? We'd be baptizing in the name of Jessica. I'm, I'm telling you, he could have done that if he wanted to. But he chose to come as a baby boy, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and the English translation of his name is Jesus. I don't have a problem with that, do you? And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And there are those that will take these stones and things and say they're significant of this, that, and the other, which would be all conjecture or theory. Uh, may or may not be. Some says the jasper stone being clear represents purity. The sardine or the sardis stone being red represents his blood. Things of that nature may or may not be true. But heaven is filled with jewels. He used to let people wear them until they started worshiping them again. See, God don't hate jewelry. Did you know that? In fact, it's how he likes them. I mean, you know, like diamonds, pearls. I mean, after all, the gates of that city is made of one several pearl. Walls of jasper. I mean, God loves Jewelry. He just don't like when you wear it. But at one time he did. He allowed the women of Israel. I don't know why it is. It seems like a woman always gets into trouble. Is that not true? I mean, it just seems like it to me. Right? 
You know they used to tell the Brother Wolf of H and M. And I just I just tell it like it is what the Bible says. Hey, I didn't say women couldn't preach. Paul did. They don't you see him getting mad at him. They just say that ain't what he meant. They know what Brother Wolf would mean. That's right. They people won't even come to church here to visit because I don't believe in women preaching. I'm just telling them what the Bible says. I mean, read it for yourself. Eve was in the transgression. And tell what the Bible says. Eve was in the transgression. That's, that's just what the Bible says. If you study the Hebrew women, they were allowed nose rings, earrings, anklets, all kinds of jewelry until it filled them with pride and they was walking and mincing as they went, according to the prophet Isaiah, I believe that it is. And the Lord said, that's it. God won't allow us nothing that will bring us pride or make us prideful because one of the seven things God hates is pride, right? According to Solomon in Proverbs, one of the seven is a proud look. These women got exalted in themselves with all of that jewelry. If jewelry wasn't the sin, it's what they allowed it to produce in their life. I'm telling you, not only jewelry, but an outfit can become sin to you, both men and women. You know, if I buy an outfit that I allow, you know, that really I think makes me look better than what I really do. You know how you're cranky on Sunday you now, and you get that new outfit. Man, you just, you buy it, and you can't wait till you get home, get it on, and get in front of that mirror and just see how you look at you. Well, that, that's all right, because you're going to make sure it fits. Right? But man, when you, you just stay in there, and you just stay, and you just stare into yourself. Man. Why? I mean, you just wow yourself. You might not have not bought that outfit. Right? Check what pride is. Man, I mean, just come to church, and then nobody looks as fine as I do. I mean, I got the finest suit a woman can buy. That's not. That's what he meant when he said costly array. We ought to dress holy, decently, to please God. Nothing wrong with having a new dress. Nothing wrong with having a new suit. That's right. See what I'm saying is you get my point. As with the jewelry, jewelry wasn't the sin. It's what they allowed it to produce in their life. Apparel is not sin. It's what we allow it to produce in our life, as well as with anything else. So God said, I'm going to take it away from him. When did he do that? In the New Testament church. Then he took that away according to the teachings of Simon Peter and Apostle Paul, First Peter chapter 3 and First Timothy chapter 2. So they said, hey, you know, not with gold or pearls or costly array. That's what he said. And people still go ahead and do it. Why? Right. You know, I mean, what's, what's wrong with the message? You know? Well, because the Bible does say adorn, which means to decorate, and I do understand that there's a difference. To decorate means to to really load it down. Like we decorate trees, we put a lot of ornaments on it, right? But see, what happens is, if one can wear a necklace, then the other one can wear earrings. See? Then the other one can wear a bracelet. Then the other one can wear, see what it leads into. See, God knew. He wasn't trying to punish anybody. Uh, what God knew is what it could lead into. See? And then you come to church and you have Lynn with a necklace. You have Haley with earrings. And you have Hillary with an anklet. Then you have this woman over here. Well, she can wear a necklace, she can wear an earring, and she can wear an anklet. Why can't I wear them all three? So she comes back out next service. She got a necklace, earring. No, oh no, no, no. And then here I go. Hey, look here. Now you're getting a little bit too far. He said, Well, I mean, what's the difference? That'd be hard to explain, wouldn't it? You know, I said, Well, between abundance or adorning. So the Lord said, I'll just save old brother Wolf for that problem. I say, Forget it. No necklace. No earrings, no anchor. Right? Save me and you both lock up. Save me from having to preach on you and you'd have to find another church. Well, it's true, you see. 
But it wasn't the jewelry. It's what it produces in one's life. God hates pride. No matter, I mean, you can just think you're pretty. <laughs> you know, the Bible says, beauty is vain. Is that not true? Beauty is vain. Because he knew, if you'll read, we, we, we call on Lucifer, what caused his fall? His beauty. What does he try to get people to do in the world today? To beautify themselves. See, because every time you look in the mirror, man, he's always on your shoulders telling you how you can improve yourself. Well, I kind of do with him. We ought to use a little improvement. I can do some more hair. You know, stuff like that. You see. But that's, that's pride. You see. And, you know, you'd look better if you had just a little lighter hair, darker hair. You know, just a different color to make you look better. I mean, you have to different color your hair to make you look better. They use those probably in any way, right? But they people do that. I mean, they're blood red. And then I tell you, <laughs> the people who live out looking, they dye their hair jet black, they know good. Well, they, I mean, you can spot them a mile off in a crowd, man. It's just as black as coal. See, but it's all about pride. But God wants us to dress decently. God wants us to dress modestly. God wants us to dress clean. God wants us to dress presentable to Him. And He said, worship Him in the beauty of holiness. And there's nothing no more beautiful than a godly man or woman dressed right. Nothing in the eyes of God. And we have no business to worry about what the world thinks. Because they don't care much about it no way because the way you're baptized. What about the way you're dressed? But he's given a description. I better hurry up now and get through this. He's given a, a description of and a view of heaven. And he that sat was to look upon, and he's talking about Jesus here, and it's uh, uh, like a jasper sword of stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. You notice he refers to them as seats. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now there's debate on what these twenty-four elders represent. Some say twelve of them are the twelve apostles. I do kind of hold that part of the view because he did tell the apostles that they would sit on 12 thrones or chairs or seats judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That takes care of 12 of them. But we don't know who the other 12 are. We're not 100% sure 12 of them are apostles. I kind of believe that they are. And I also believe 12 of them are 12 representatives of the Old Testament. And there you have around about the throne both represented the church and Israel. And that is part of it. I can go uh, with that view. And even that is conjecture, just theorizing that it could be. Uh, it may be 24 completely different men than that. I don't know. But we just know that he's seen 24 seats and there's 24 elders sitting on it. We do find the term elders recorded in both the Old and New Testament. Men were referred to as elders uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, the Sanhedrin, even in the New Testament, while under the law, had elders. Then even the church, there's elders in the church, uh, which is ministers. So we do have that. And if we wanted to know exactly who the 24 was, he would tell us. Now, we do know also that the names of the, the 12 tribes of Israel, their names will be in the foundations of that city. We do know that. So there's uh, someone to tie that together, perhaps. Verse 5. Now, John is seeing this. This is what he sees when he gets there. And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunders, 
brethren, and voices. And there were seven lengths of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And we read of those seven spirits of God. Um, pretty sure it says that didn't mean that the seven individual spirits, but it was God in the seven churches. Today, every how many apostolic local congregations that there are that's walking by way of truth, the Spirit of the Lord is in them. And that don't mean it's one God per church, but it's one God in all the churches. And God is able to do that. These thunder and, and lightnings is, is believed to represent the judgment that John is about to see that is to come upon the earth that he is to write about. We read about it again in Exodus 19 and 16. And this was with the children of Israel. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet. See, it's God speaking exceedingly loud, exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. So God would come down in a cloud, thunderings and lightnings, and he would speak to the people. Well, they got so afraid, they told Moses, said, look, we don't want to hear from that fellow anymore. You go talk to him. <laughs> and then you come talk to us, and that's the way that it went. So they was afraid because of the power of the voice. Uh, it is believed, and I don't agree with that, but it very well could be that John, by these thunder and lightnings, he's getting ready to show him the judgments. We know that he's going to see the judgments beginning in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, with the opening of the first seal. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, in fact, that city that is built has a street of gold as transparent glass. We can't even imagine how beautiful that city that is in the midst of the earth really is. Uh, having walls of jasper, a street of gold, pure gold as a transparent glass, uh, the, the gate itself being of one solid pearl, it will be the most beautiful building that we will ever see. And the thing about it is, God's people will get to live in it for a thousand years. You think about that. Live in it, and it's, it's 12,000 furlongs high, wide, and square. And somebody uh, figured out the measurement of a furlong, which equaled out to be, if the measurements are correct, 1,500 miles high, wide, that's a lot of space, ain't it? Now, each foundation, which are 12, if you multiply that by 1,500, you've got all that space. I didn't do all of that, so you figure that out when you get home. I won't ask Roger, because that's a lot of figures. <laughs> Man, have to have a calculator to do that, right? But it's a big space. And that's where that God's people going to live for a thousand years, ruling here on earth. I'm saying people don't know what God's gonna, got in store for them. Or, or, a lot of people don't. And just, just what God, no wonder Paul said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither is it entered into the heart of man or the mind of man. We can't even imagine in our wildest dreams all of the glory that God's going to bestow upon us. I'm telling you, if people could really get a hold of that and grasp that, they would throw away everything that the world has got to offer all the money that the world's got to offer, all the gold and silver. They would, if they, if man had a choice right now to have all the money that he could ever spend in a thousand lifetimes, all of the things of the world as to homes and vacation spots and automobiles and jet planes, all that he wanted to the field on one side, and then on the other side, the things that God has prepared for man, he wouldn't look twice at the things of the world. No man would. It would take a fool. It would take someone that would not be mentally capable of making the right judgment to choose that. But see, what the problem is, 
we see with the eye the things of the world. We see how the rich live. We've even thought about ourselves what it would be like. Just to have so much money that you decided to go to Florida, you could go. If you decide to go to Paris, you could go. If you decide you want to buy your home in Hawaii, you could do it. And just and they, they people on earth have had that much money. I mean, they send people to own islands. Can you imagine what it'd be like to have that much money? Uh, we can't even imagine that. But see, we what it is, we see it in other people because there's people that we see it. There used to be a program to come on the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Did you ever watch it? Me and I tell you, I watched it one time. I looked at it and said, wow, four and a half. I mean, Oprah Winfrey thought, man, I'd like to live in her basement. I'm telling you, I would. Man, all over the place. Man, and here I got to live a while. Okay? But the thing about it is, there's not a structure on earth that could even compare to that city that he has built in heaven for us. And beyond that. So, so when we get down and out, and we get in, and we get discouraged. Think upon those things. Think about what God's got for you. And see, on top of that, you're going to live forever. You see, Ophra is going to die. And then Jesus said, "Whose would those things be? She can't take it with her. Donald Trump. He's going to die one of these days." Then whose would those things be? What we get, we get to keep to live. And forever and ever and ever. Why wouldn't anybody want to serve the Lord? Why? Why wouldn't they? And you know what the sad part about it is? We got members of our own family. Some of us have got children that ain't very bright. I got three of them. Dumb and a bunch of liars. Yeah, they are. I mean, you know, you take them about to be in the church and heard this and then walk away from it, just think very bright. I'm sad to say I've got two I raised two of them. But maybe one of these days they'll see the light, I pray they will. And if they don't see that light, they're the light they will see. That's sad but true. It's the truth. How can anybody give this? For that, but people do that. They do. One of the reasons is is because they've never seen that. All they've heard somebody like me tell about it. You know, just like you know, I'm telling you, this is here and it's real. But see, you got to believe it. You you got to believe it. If you don't believe it, you know, why bother even trying? I believe this, don't you? I mean, if this ain't true, I'm gonna be mad. Well, the fact of the matter is, if it ain't true, we die, we die. We ain't going to nobody know. Right? I mean, if I'd, rather, I'd rather live with hope than to live hopeless, wouldn't you? I mean, you got these people running around and say they don't believe in God. Man, they have nothing beyond the grave. And man, if you have to go through life poor and you have nothing beyond the grave, man, you got bopped upside the head twice. Is that true? You've got to live poor and you didn't get nothing eternally either. But see, God made it so. No matter how we have to live in this life, the next life, man, we're going to have, you're going to have, a, you're going to have more than you can do anything with. You're going, you're going to have that life that sometimes we see in the natural that, man, we wonder how it would be just to be able to live like that. But knowing that Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. And I know that God at sundry times made the people rich in the Old Testament. He did Abraham. He certainly did. He did Solomon. I mean, Solomon had wealth. But now the church seems to have had to take a different path. And he knows that where our treasure is, there would be a heart also. I wouldn't want a million dollars sitting for that man, would you? I wouldn't want to win. And when we see on television from time to time, your state lottery and, and somebody win $150 million. And 
maybe get a hundred of it. I can catch it. But this fellow up here in West Virginia did it, didn't he? Did it right now. Or something like that. One of the, one of the big ones. Can't take it with me. I want something that will last forever, you see. And I believe this. I really do. I believe this. And before the throne, verse 6, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. A sea of glass like crystal. And people think of something that has crystal thing, do we? We all have crystal thing. We use crystal. It's made out of plastic. <laughs> That's about as close to crystal as we'll get. It's what you see hanging right here. It's actually plastic. <laughs> but this sea of glass is like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. They'd be monstrous to us, but they're creatures of worship, which is what they are. And the Bible says in verse 7 through 9, And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a cat, the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying angel. And we won't get into the description of all the animals or what they mean tonight. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. To us it's, it's monstrous to see a creature with a four-sided head with these different depictions and with six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. We have proven that this phrase is to Jesus Christ, who is the Almighty God. And... How important is worship that he's got these beasts that do nothing but cry holy, holy, holy continually. And when these beasts give glory and honor, which is what we're to do when we come to church, and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. This is not the first mention of these beasts. Isaiah saw them in a vision in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzzah died, Isaiah speaking, he said, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. Notice the singular, singularity of the throne in the New Old Testament to prove that there is but one God. Upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. That's what we're reading about here. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. See, God demands and commands worship, and we need to understand that. When we come to church, we come to worship, to lift up him, not to look pretty, not to cry down, not to be seen and not to be heard, but to worship God. And if we'll do that simple command, we'll please him. That's Revelation 10 and 11. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. Notice the terminology is they, they fell down before him, this God, this deity that's on the throne. And worship him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. What made him worthy? Says one of the things was his death on Calvary. That's what made him worthy from us. He saved us and has washed us and made us whiter than snow in his own blood. And these 24 elders, whoever they are, 
understood that it was by his blood and by him and him alone that they are in heaven. And they worship him. And the thrones that was given to them, they give back to him in honor and glory. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things. And this phrase in this last verse in this chapter enables us to identify without a doubt who he's referring to when he made the phrase in verse 8, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. We know that the Scripture plainly says that it's the Lord Jesus Christ that is to come. But there's other Scriptures that we can, without a doubt, prove that Jesus is God Almighty sitting on His throne. That this deity on His throne that John is standing before, that the elders are bowing before, is the Creator. Notice, for thy pleasure they are and were created. Who is the Creator? Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. John 1, 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, through the Word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So, verse 1, 2, and 3 is alluding to the Creator. Now, go on down to verse 14. I didn't put that down. Go ahead to verse 14. Because it tells us beyond a shadow of a doubt who it is. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And no theologian, albeit oneness, trinity, or dualist, disagree that verse 14 is referring to Jesus Christ. They all doctrines agree to that. So we know now that Jesus Christ created all things. Last place in Scripture, Isaiah 44 and 23. That there is a single creator and not three. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb, proving that life begins inside the womb, not outside. And he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things. If he made everything, nobody else could have made anything. That stretched forth the heavens alone that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. So it is clear that in chapter 4, in closing, John said, after this, after what? The last message, which is significant to the last message being preached, something happens. There's a door open into heaven. Someone passes through that door, John did, which represents the church of Jesus Christ. The church is raptured. How? By verse 2, the change. The remaining verses of verse 3 in chapter 4 throughout that chapter, and chapter 5, John is in heaven, and he's seeing things that is about to transpire on the earth. And as we'll see when we get there, the very first thing that happens on earth after the rapture of Revelation 4, 1 and 2 is the revelation of the man of sin and the Antichrist. And it is just that simple. And that'll be all.